we have liftoff. Um, okay, I think we can just dive right in. So uh, thank you very much for joining me, Claire. Um, it's, um, yeah, you're somebody I wanted to talk to for a while um, because, um, well, for a lot of reasons, really, but uh, first of all, to help me understand um, what's being done on a bigger scale in terms of uh, R&D in the Regen Ag world and, uh, and what that means. So could I just ask you to give us a, a kind of rundown of who and where you are and, uh, and what you're up to? Yeah, um, it's great to be here. Thanks ever so much for having me. Uh, so I, uh, Claire Hill, um, I'm Regenerative Agriculture Director for FAI Farms. Um, but right here and now today, I'm sitting on my little farm in Shropshire. Uh, we moved here as a family um, to a small family farm um, in February. So it's been really interesting to get a kind of perspective of uh, doing another farm on a regen journey from the ground up. So that's, that's yeah, quite enjoying that. And um, tell me what FIA is. So oh, we are a, um, a consultancy firm, I guess, working with food businesses on better food systems at land and sea. Um, so we cover the aquaculture and wild court as well. Um, it, we started off uh, 20 years ago in, I think, when no one was talking about animal welfare and our founders um, were really passionate about that. And they started kicked off by working with McDonald's and Tesco's and, um, and quickly realised that actually they had lots more ideas, and but but it was all new ideas at the time and realised that they needed a farm to put these ideas into practice. Um, and so that's when they started with the um, tenancy at the Oxford University owned farm um, in Whiteham near Oxford. And then that's continued on and then everything's grown. The farming operations has grown and the consultancy business has grown and branched out into um, data systems, I guess, to support the changes that we want to make. Often data can be uh, is key to that. Um, and so kind of intuitive data systems to support better, better food systems. Okay, so it, it's, it's a commercial farm, but one of the kind of reasons for its existence is 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 research into low impact and regenerative methods is that is that kind of was that sort of sum it up um and you you mentioned two brands there that um i think a lot of people myself included wouldn't expect to be involved in researching regen ag which was tesco and mcdonald's can you um are you allowed to talk about that about the work they're doing and why and um can you can you give me a bit of light on particularly i think people be interested in what McDonald's are doing in the in the regenerative space. Yeah, so um, we we McDonald's would have um, a real interest in regenerative agriculture, um, particularly because uh, beef um, is obviously the mainstay. If McDonald's don't have beef on the menu, then that's quite quite difficult for people, okay. and that um, one of the easiest. Um, uh, species, I guess, to transition to regenerative agriculture is is is, is cattle. But also tied up with that is because one of the perceived biggest impactors on climate change, I guess, is also beef cattle. And therefore, the whole thing sort of ties up um, into an interest in regenerative agriculture being part of the solution for a number of different problems, including the overall carbon footprint of the business. Um, they're also because McDonald's obviously operate in lots of countries in the world and McDonald's uh, Global, uh, their overarching organization sits in the US. And of course, there's the McDonald's US business as well. And they um, I, funny that Regen Ag is kind of like more it's it's in, in America, basically, where you've got like two extremes. You've got the most advanced regenerative agriculture movement, mm -hmm. I would say. But you've also got chlorinated chicken. So you've got the like worst. both. The best <laughs> the worst. worst in one country. Yeah, I've, I've always exactly. thought that about the states interestingly so they've got um and so over there they've um involved in a project uh, mcdonald's with um, peter bick and carbon cowboys and actually looking at um, a four-year project to look at regenerative farms or and their neighbors so it's like a neighbor study um and looking at both the the animal health of soil and the people interestingly so interestingly a deep dive into the attitudes of the people running both mm. those types of farms with the idea that then that will help to understand it more and how can we roll it out bigger so when we saw that um mcdonald's were doing that in the us we thought well you know we've got this livestock farm sitting here and we'd already been talking about going pasture only and we thought why don't we uh why don't we see if we can take that the whole hog and see if does 
AMP grazing, a tool of regenerative agriculture, adaptive multi paddock grazing? Does it work in the UK? At that stage, we didn't even know the answer to that question. So that was our original research question with McDonald's on regenerative beef. Amazing. And now, of course, uh, you've led me in very well to um, to ask the, the big question. What is AMP grazing? How does it differ from mob grazing, strip grazing, holistic management? Um, these are all terms I'm aware of, but I really don't understand the differences. Could you, could you tell me a bit about that? Uh, I, yes, uh, AMP grazing would be most similar to holistic plan grazing, so the model that comes out of the Savory Institute. Um, okay. But adaptive multi paddock grazing was coined by um, um, Alan Williams in the states, um, and his his his. Uh, I think the key um, in its in its method, it's very similar. So it's a high density of animals for a short period of time, mm -hmm. followed by a long rest period. Um, and um, but but the adaptive and, and the key word within it is the adaptive nature, the fact that, that that we have to and 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 that we that we need to plan grazing. So the point about adaptive, because often people think once you write a plan, oh, well, that's too restrictive. The weather changes. I can't right. always stick to it. But the key is that there is a plan, but it, it's incredibly adaptive, whether that be about the weather, the animals you want to go on holiday, you sell the farm, whatever that adaption needs to be on a daily, a, there's big adaptions on monthly basis or small ones on a daily basis. But the ultimate, the ultimate point about high density of animals, short period of time, followed by a long rest period. And it's that long rest period that differentiates it from maybe our rotational grazing, where we're maybe working on focused on utilization, Maybe we're going in at two and a half kilograms of dry matter a hectare coming out at 1800 um, and we're on a maybe a 21 day cycle because although that system grows more grass than a set stocked where animals are just turned out in a field and left for weeks, yeah. months in the same field. Although that rotational grazing does grow more grass, it's not having the kind of magic unlocking of um, the soil health, the root depth, um, letting some of those species come that are slower to come to fruition and bringing diversity into our systems through that. Yeah, I mean, that, I must admit what you've described for my basic understanding of holistic management, it sounds like that's what you've described. And I think the important thing in there is that is that feedback loop, is that sort of um, reacting to not, as you said, not setting a plan and sticking to it rigidly because that's a plan, but actually kind of knowing how to make changes along the way when things change, which inevitably that they do. And how, how, you know, what have you discovered? Uh, you said it started in the States and you were trying to work out the feasibility of it in the UK. How, how has that worked? How, because I would have thought that, well, I mean, the States has a, a lot of varied kind of steady state st systems. I mean, there's huge different amounts of landscapes and ecosystems. So I would imagine that there are places where this does and doesn't work. But I would think that particularly the, the west of the country in the UK is very suited to this. How, how, how's, how's the research going? Yeah, and good. And actually, I would say the east of the country is even more suited to it because, oh, really? um, okay. because, well, just because we suffer from drought, you know, drought is a reality. I mean, not now, right. like this spring, not so much, but yeah. previous, you know, we've had droughty springs. Who'd have thought that in this green and pleasant land that we have? But over in the east, we are, you know, drought is a, a usual thing now. Um, now, of course, we're not seeing it like we see it in other parts of the world, but cracks in the ground, dry land. Talking to my dad the other day, he's from North Lincolnshire, and he's like, oh, we could really do some rain. Crops are starting to struggle. Well, you know, that I feel like that's the, that's the story every year now. Um, and, and, and one of the biggest benefits of this type of grazing is it preventing evaporation and uh, uh, oh, yeah. adapting the soil to be able to hold on to more water. And that's like the biggest productivity unlocker in a grass-based system particularly. Um, and so, it, yeah, it turns out that it, it does work quite well often, a critique of Alan Savory's model is that it, it's based very much on the holistic management. It's based very much on a brittle environment. Yeah, so, de desert landscapes rather than lush pasture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So key key there is the adaption. We don't need to do it in exactly the same way, but the principles um, of it of it work. And um, and and I guess what's our key learnings? Firstly, that we outwinter on a farm that everybody told us you'd never outwinter on, on heavy clay. Um, mm. And we outwintered this winter, all our cows and calves. Uh, that we grow more grass, that our um, inputs have gone down. And, and, I, and I say that from a place of being an organic farm. So we didn't have high inputs before, but we've less labour. We don't use the topper now because we used to follow all our grazings with a topper to try and keep on top of weeds. 
our weed bird and Sorry, what, 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 Claire, what's a topper? A topper, like a mower, a mower. Okay, right. A mower to cut weeds. It's just a bit more... Um, it's a bit more uh, brunt. It's a bit, yeah, it's a but bit it cuts. It cuts everything, surely. Or yeah, is yeah, it, it does. Yeah, it? Right, okay. Yeah, it cuts everything. But we would use it after grazing. So the so the animals would go in and eat the grass basically, and then we'd oh, and they leave behind. they leave like thistles and stuff, and then you take all those off. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, ignorant, but thank you. No, 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 no. I get too into it and forget, I forget, <laughs> forget all of these. Forget things. you're talking to somebody in the centre of London. <laughs> Uh, so we used to do that and we were burning diesel. We're using the tractor. So our tractor hours have come down. We don't use the tractor as much. Um, and generally it's like a happier place to be. So that's one of being the key learnings is this just before it felt like a treadmill. We're on a treadmill and every yeah. year it was like, oh, it won't rain this much next lambing. Surely it will be better. And it was just this like hope that things would be better next year. And we would we would adjust plans slightly, but really we were it was always too much rain, not enough rain. We're kind of blaming all these things that are actually outside of our control. Yeah. So let's look at what we can control. And what's come with that is this sense of calm and peace, which which w- w- has replaced frantic anxiety, I guess. And um and that and and, and the 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 best example I have of that is not this spring, but um, last spring. It was this like weird drought spring, driest, coldest spring on record. And uh, and of course, all you're reading all over the farming press is uh, people are having to to feed out. They haven't got enough grass for the mm-hmm. fact that animals are calving and lambing, and it's really stressful. People have not, don't know what to do, and they're burning money having to keep animals um, fed. And and Humphrey, who was working with us on the farm at the time, he said isn't it amazing? Like everybody around us is so stressed and we're not, we don't have that now. We don't have that anxiety. I was like, yeah, it really is. It was, it was great. And um, we felt a little bit smug, but yes, that's why I guess we try and talk about it as much as we can. If everyone <laughs> else can... Every, yeah. right, every right for smugness there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to sort of go back to something you, you said at the beginning of that, where you're talking about reducing inputs. Um, and I've heard this from some of our suppliers who have, you know, stated that the the ultimate aim of that would be to get to a point where the only inputs were sunlight and rainwater. But how feasible is that within a sort of UK, uh, be, you know, um, suckler herd? It, can, could you ever foreseeably get to a point where maybe taking a bit of groundwater is the only input that you have? I think we're nearly there. I, I mean, um, from a inputs from a land management and feed point of view. Yeah. So we, we just, that's, that's a key. That's such a good one. I, I just never thought when someone said it to me the first time, I was like, Oh yeah. The, the, I think Ben Taylor Davis talks about the, the three freeze. And one of those is sunlight. One of those is water and one of them soil. And we just don't think about those first and foremost in our farming systems. It, crazily, when, you know, when you realize it, you're like, Oh yeah. Well, so it's all, um, it's all that nature's got, right? Yeah. And it does so <laughs> such great, great yeah. stuff and produces in abundance that we just can't mimic as farm systems. Nowhere, no farm system, human intervened system in the world produces as much biomass as areas of the Amazon, for example, that are just left to do their own devices. Like, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and I would say that we're there with the grazing. Our inputs really now are around um, people's time, electric fencing in order sure. to manage the cells, um, uh, cells being the, 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 the way we manage the animals in that we move them across the farm like the herds would have roamed, but rather than wolves and things, keeping them it was sort of as, yeah, as it's together electric fences, it's yeah. electric fencing um, Which, although not entirely pleasant or, or, or more pleasant than a wolf yes more pleasant than the wolf and of course yeah. um and and they're, they're there and the animals can see them and they know what they are so they don't touch them and they they know the system they love it you go in the morning they know they're going to get moved they're waiting patiently for the next for the next piece of grass and and, and it's really good um and I've forgotten what the original question or no, train it, of thought it, it was. was here. Just about input. It was about getting, <laughs> yes, getting inputs low. So if if you know if if you can achieve this state where the inputs are low and particularly there is no kind of carbon based fuel usage on the farm, um, how 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 do you think it's possible to reach a balance where the sequestration is outstripping the emissions in terms of carbon? Um, I know it's it's an incredibly contentious issue, the, the whole kind of uh, carbon and methane issue. And there's something I've never fully understood, and I I've asked quite a lot of people this, and I've had varying responses. But to my mind, in my logic, 
every gram of carbon that comes out of a cow's mouth through enteric fermentation started in the atmosphere because plant takes it up photosynthesis turns it into carbohydrates cow eats carbohydrates part of that carbon comes back out as as co4 or co2 um so as long as so this is like a closed loop of about 10 years if you're not burning fossil fuels or you're not adding significant more numbers of cattle into the system surely that has to be a greenhouse gas loss leader because any sequestration will be removing carbon from that system do you consider that to be correct yeah i mean it's you're right about it being contentious contentious and also i think still a bit unclear you know the fact that nobody uh can people can answer different elements of it so for example what's methane's impact and how long does that last and, and what does it do but but what we just don't know we don't know how um uh well we do know that for example carbon sits in the soil it gets into the soil in different ways and then it stays stable in different ways or non-stable yeah. and all of that is affected by so many different things um and so yeah there, there is uh that there, there is that your, your your model yes potentially it's right but i think what we sometimes miss is when we just talk about carbon we think yeah it's always going to be difficult to have it as it will that we will if we get the soil working really well we will be sequestering hopefully we'd sequester more than those animals are emitting and that mm -hmm. and if we're not using any fossil fuel based input then then that's good um and therefore we have a carbon neutral beef system technically but what we miss from that is the benefit that grazing cattle have on biodiversity, water holding capacity yep. and everything else that they have. And so if you take a, um, you know, a chicken in a concrete shed bedded on uh, shavings, um, it might look like it's a lower carbon emitter, but uh, but as it, it's, it's a million miles from a, a cyclical ecosystem yep. that a grazing ruminant is as part of that. So I think I am no carbon expert at all. And so I'm not going to try, try and answer those questions. But, OK, OK. But um, yeah. no, I mean, I, I, I it's obviously from a kind of a lay person view and, and obviously from, you know, the, pl the, the plant based movement seems incredibly focused on on this this one issue of, of carbon and um and uh, I find it very difficult to understand where the argument comes from. And also, like you said, I think there, there are kind of slightly more important issues. And one, one of them is, is soil and biodiversity and, and, and actually just, you know, how grazing ruminants as part of an ecosystem can just can repair. I want to go back back to something you said earlier um, when, when I suggested that the west of the country was good for grazing. You said, actually, what we need to do is put it on the east of the country. Um, from my limited understanding, there is a bit of a kind of east-west divide and, and the east of the country is, is a lot of arable and the west is more kind of grazing and dairy. Were you suggesting that perhaps we should integrate grazing into arable cycles? Do you think, um, that, do you think that would be kind of the way forward so that not just, it's all very well, like you mentioned McDonald's um, uh, were putting the research into beef, but if they're even if they're producing their beef regeneratively, if their grains to make the buns are still being done with industrial monocultures that are trashing the soil, that's only kind of half the battle won. But surely if they integrate the whole lot in a sort of stacked enterprise or closed loop, um, that would be the way forward. Are you guys researching the, the links between how to use animals to restore soil health, not just for the soil, but for future crop growth? So, um, I think there's a few questions wrapped up in that one. Yeah, the first sorry, that one, was a big one. No, no. I'll, I'll let you, you can go for a while on that one. <laughs> That's the, the first one is, uh, you know, is it beneficial to have animals in in arable systems? Uh, yes, and I don't know. I don't even think we need to do that research because we talk to any any uh, any arable farmer now that's reintegrating stock onto their farm, and they they well wouldn't go back uh, I, I think is the main thing there so even if the hassle of having the animals is there the which is why that stopped in the first place is because it can be quite challenging um but um but 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 they're seeing the benefits particularly in this uh, like combined system so if you're bringing cover crops well you can destroy destroy the cover crop mechanically after it's done its job ready for planting in the next crop or you can bring animals in and add further diversity there so i think that that goes without saying that that is beneficial um and that um that there's the that should be a direction of travel for for, for most people in in their system um absolutely uh and yeah so so grain system where we are producing grain then it it, it ultimately if you're just taking it away every year 
even if you're putting some muck back on or some other sort of soil conditioner, it's it's it might be putting the fertility back, but mm-hmm. it's not really um, replacing all of the mycorrhizal fungi and everything else that's lost. And of course, using um, techniques like direct drilling, where we're not disturbing the soil, is really making a fundamental impact on that. But you also raised another point as part of that, which is food businesses thinking holistically. I think because, like you say, at the moment there's big focus on beef within yeah. within McDonald's. Um, that's not to say there's not work going on in other areas. But we see this, I think I would say, you know, across the board, really, it's this shift from silo to holistic thinking. And that goes, you know, throughout the whole supply chain is needed because at the moment, often the conversation is about how are we going to help our farmers become more regenerative? And we're not quite yet that I've mentioned it a couple of times, but we're not quite yet at the point where there's an acceptance to say, yeah, we can help you do the farmers, but what about you guys? How are you going to operate in a more regenerative way? Because if we transition all these farmers to a regenerative system, how will you support that? Because your current business model is probably focused on, um, you know, on 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 operating in silos. It will be an efficiency based, just in time model, and that yeah. doesn't necessarily fit with a regenerative mindset. So, there's a, a question there for food businesses about what, what what's your step on 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 on, on regeneration. Interesting. I want to come back to the the big business bit, but just sort of um, ask you about a a little point that you made when you were talking there about um, the kind of integrated systems. Could you, um, were you talking about arable and putting animals into the arable? I I mean, I I think I understand this, but just for anyone listening, could you explain what cover crops are? Oh, sorry. Yes. So one of the, um, one of the big things I think we've realized that we've been getting wrong is exposed soil. Nature hates exposed soil. Exposed soil evaporates water. It washes away in rainfall and it emits carbon because it's just open and there's nothing holding onto it. So what we, what, what is unilaterally agreed, I think, and nobody denies this one, um, is that the more we can see, keep soil covered uh, in food production or in any production, the, the better. And of course, the conventional cereal where we're growing a crop of wheat uh, to make um, bread out of for example we're we're harvesting that in july and then we're cultivating that soil to prepare it for the next crop and it's sitting bare for often months on end particularly if we're maybe not going to re-sow a crop in it until the following spring and it could could, could be six six months plus of uh, just bare earth and and actually uh one of the one of the farmers who i visited who um said put this very very well uh, about cover cropping he, he said that when um sunlight hitting bare earth is, is a waste of the most precious resource we have which is the opportunity for sunlight to capture carbon and put it in the ground um and that was i thought that was a pretty brilliant statement sorry but uh, yeah no, I, I couldn't agree more what, what he said yep and uh and then so a cover crop effectively is a crop that once you've harvested your wheat you then sow a cover crop, um, which will be made up of a, a real mixture of different plants, depending on what your farm is doing, um, but mostly focused around deep roots, fast growth, so that they're capturing as much sunlight as possible and that they spread out quickly and keep that soil covered. And then what you've got there is a, like almost acts as a soil conditioner, fertility builder, right. brings a lot of stuff back naturally to the soil, which means your need, need for pesticides, will, uh, sorry, fertilizers will be less and everything that for the following crop yeah so it covers the soil what what sort of plants are they are they plants that are useful to us that are used for this purpose or what what sort of things you mentioned fast growing with with sorry i keep closing the window because the train's going past but you mentioned (laughs) fast growing plants with deep roots what 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 kind of things would that be oh so various types of we tend to use um fodder uh, type crop so it would be things like radish sugar beet okay. um uh and and chick herbs like chicory and things but they would be um they would be ones that are, are probably the the varieties that are selected are those that are, would often appeal to animals so often people would plant the cover crop grow it and then before they um plant the next crop in it they would use animals to go across and graze it so it would be um, right. things that have deep tap roots um but also this yeah the variety elements so a number of different plants so grasses forbs legumes so from different okay, plant groups rather than yeah. yeah singular things yeah so some nitrogen fixing some phosphorus bits and pieces and things like that so you mentioned before when you're talking about cover crops that there were kind of three ways of getting rid of them one was mechanical which i assume is like plowing it back into the land presumably one is chemical which would mean the use of something like glyphosate and then the third is 
it's grazing. Well, out of those three, to me, there's a clear winner, um, which which is grazing, which is going to have a, a benefit of you know, as someone someone brilliantly said, a cow is a is a lawnmower at the front and a muck spreader at the back with it with a bio, with a compost heap in the middle, and and it does it very quickly and efficiently, and and it spreads it out evenly. But I can imagine the difficulty in this if you are sort of an East Anglia you know cereal grower um, is how do you then just become uh, a beef farmer for six months of the year I mean it's it, surely we need a huge fundamental change in sort of some sort of pastoral nomadic infrastructure system where beef farmers are, are traveling around the country with with their herds or something I don't quite understand how the logistics could work because I would also imagine that the arable farmer doesn't have either the expertise nor the equipment nor the knowledge to then set, suddenly say well I'm going to finish cattle for six months in between my crop rotations how do you think we could get better at that I think um, I think it's a business opportunity and I think there are there are that have snapped it up um, uh, and, and are already already doing that I went to um, college with someone called joe and her and her husband are doing exactly that with with sheep that's the, the kind oh, of wow. one of the, okay. the basis of their businesses is if their business so they've got the kit they've got the livestock and the, that they they um they've their own farm but then they they do a lot of grazing on other farms and they're kind of um, in hertfordshire um so there's an opportunity there there's also an opportunity for share farming for bringing new entrants in you know it's an opportunity if an arable farmer would like to bring uh, livestock to the farm, but they don't want all of that. That those things you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Um, then it's an opportunity because farming so hard to get into. But of course, a career that brings this connection with the land is actually so important to so many people for our physical, mental health, and everything else. And we've lost that when you know we've 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 kind of become very urbanised. And so it's a, it's a, it's a it's something to, to be thought about as an opportunity. Okay, how can how can I set this up? I want to bring the livestock, but I don't want the total responsibility. How can I support other people into the industry? um through that so there's a number of different models there's a number of different models of doing it and they are happening they are happening but but more of them yeah i just we just need more of it no I, I can imagine for someone who is you know who does want to get into farming but doesn't have access to their own land it could be a an opportunity to to basically provide that service to other people's land yeah no, that's fascinating. I mean, I'm I'm a big believer that the only way we're going to kind of farm our way out of the current predicament is this sort of idea of stacked enterprise and almost sort of nomadic farming. And I, I've spoken to, you know, the guys at Yeo Valley, for example, who are starting to graze arable in between and move their dairy cows around and have mobile milking parlours and things. And, and of course, what Tim May is doing at Kingsclear in this sort of similar fashion of rotations and sort of shared enterprise with, with the farmers. I just want to come back to something you said before, where you were talking about, you know, the the difficulty of big businesses getting involved in perhaps the unpredictable nature of regenerative agriculture. What do you see the, the biggest? So I, I'm, I'm super fascinated. I'm not going to lie. I'm super fascinated about the idea that McDonald's are getting involved in Regenag, particularly because I don't see them talking about it. So it's obviously something that is happening maybe a little bit at corporate level rather than public facing level but how how far away well i'm going to throw a few questions instead of one bundle but what what are the obstacles that they would need to overcome to have a truly regenerative supply chain and how close are they to achieving that oh that's a good question so um i think they are they are talking about so at the moment it's a project on one farm and they're looking of okay. You know, the question is, how do you scale? How do you scale when you source uh, McDonald's would would be they make burgers so they're not mm -hmm. using fillet they're, they're they're using four quarter and flank um all proper meat and all of that i must just yeah. emphasize you know because i know that will be a critic thing you know it's all from real animals um but it's the you know the supermarkets take the prime cuts and the likes of mcdonald's and other burger makers they take the they take yeah. the four quarter and flank and actually as a nation it means we balance carcasses very well it's actually a really efficient model um and uh and so they're taking uh they're taking effectively beef from probably around you know 15 17 thousand beef farmers they would be taking parts of those animals because they're taking them almost from every they're buying four quarter and flank from you know all the all the all the good and approved abattoirs in the country so farm-wise it's a challenge yes yeah, a challenge yeah. it's a challenge yeah. so 
there's a couple of ways you know there's a there's a how do you do that that the mcdonald's are seeing um growth like for like growth every quarter consecutively for i can't remember how many years it is now but we we have to understand that as a business they are growing and therefore their volume is growing and yeah so how do they do that i don't think i have the answer i guess i'm just uh, highlighting a couple of the the challenges that that, that come about so the I guess at the moment it's an exploratory. Yeah. We know we, we know we need to do more. Uh, we have a carbon footprint that we need to try and work out how we're going to offset as a business. And actually, agriculture, well, you know, scope three emissions, the agriculture side of emissions, make up the majority of most food businesses' emissions. And so, mm-hmm. how do we help tackle that? Food from a regenerative system is likely to be part of that solution. And so that's where they're at the exploratory stage at that at the moment. Um, I think that's the that's the the fair to say. But they've. I guess they made a commitment to the AMP project in where we started it in 2020. So they made the commitment in 2019. And that was, you know, if you, everybody now is like regen, regen, regen. That's all you ever hear. But um, back yeah. back then, it wasn't that so much. So they kind of made a leap of, leap of faith early on, early on in this movement, I would say. Interesting. So it, for them, really, in terms of transitioning their business, it's um, it's like, turning a tanker ship around it's you know the initial inputs have started but the momentum is going to take a very long time before the ship actually moves and you know and, and that's been achieved um i was at an event last night which was a sort of debate um veganism versus ethical omnir- omnivorism and um and i was representing the ethical omnivore and um you know a lot of people are asking questions about kind of you know feasibility and scale and things like that and um I, I, yeah, I found it very interesting that it was, I was being asked the questions of, of like, how can, how can this scale up and, and where will that come from? Is it coming from, um, you know, is it coming from farmers making the change? And I believe that um, it's going to come not from, well, it, of course it will come from farmers making the change, but I, I'm a great believer in indus, industrial change coming from consumer pressure. Um, and, and I believe that when the public are fully educated and actually understand what regenerative is, that will force the change in the industry and that will cause brands to start to say to their supply chain, we need regenerative because it's what our customers want. But I also fear that we're about to enter what I call the wild west of regen ag, where the term is used, abused and greenwashed. What do you think we can do in the coming sort of, say, three to five years to mitigate the problems of of regen being used as a greenwash term with without clear definitions what do we need to do to to clarify that so that the public will have faith in in it as a as a, as a concept and standard yeah okay i think i i agree with most of that and i think but the one bit i would just say is i think it is actually uniquely in on this occasion it's a it's something that can only happen from the ground up so there can be market Mm. indicators and there can be you know pressure or support or whatever that comes from the from the food industry but ultimately nobody can tell someone how to be a regenerative farmer because it is about listening or observing and reacting to feedback from your own ecosystem as a farmer which is your farm so you can't sit in an office in london somewhere and say this is what you must do and and and, and pull up this list of prescriptions which tends to be as we as we act now our certification schemes it's great they keep our food safe but they are lists of things you're told to do that you have to keep paper work about they are nothing looks purely at the output of the land and so i think that um i think it will actually come from all angles more farmers will do it because it 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 makes sense particularly with the volatility of uh, inputs not just cost but availability and the and the long-term impact that's going to have buying grain to feed ruminant animals uh with with the pressures that are coming in the world or on, on food security, it's just going to become a bit of a no, you know, not not sensible to do anymore. I feel, and mm. so I think it will. People will switch to it anyway. Um, it will switch to it anyway, and then I think the the, the 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 question we just have to keep asking is when everybody's talking about regenerative is, and how and, and tell me how you look at your land to know it's regenerating because lots of like oh yeah we use a direct drill or. Yes, we cover our slurry store and now we're using effective microbes in our slurry. They're all really good things. They're all really good tools, but they used in isolation. They don't mean that you are a regenerative farm. Is your land and water cycle regenerating? And the only people that have really 
coined a way of measuring that so far is uh, Alan Savory and the Ecological Outcome Verification, yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. EOV, the way of measuring there. Because that literally, they as, as a farmer, it's the best audit in the world. They come to the farm, they spend two days with us and we go around the whole farm and we look at our land and we see what's happening and we compare it to our notes from last year. And wow, what an, what an experience. There's not a tick box in sight. And that's amazing. So right. I think that's the thing. It's that we're just all we have to do to avoid the greenwashing is just keep asking the question, how do you know your land is regenerating? And then that 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 washes through any other any other things. So you always need. I, I, I've I've often said this to people trying to understand what what regen is, and I, I've explained it as outcome based, not prescriptive. But you, but for something to be outcome based and measured, you always need two points with with a gap of time in between, right? So you need a baseline and then a secondary measurement a year, three or five years later to actually know that you're regenerating. Um, what the thing that I'm slightly puzzled about is. If regen is purely outcome based, um, are there, is there the possibility to be conventional and regenerative versus organic and regenerative? And, and how, how do you see, you could be potentially, you could be non-sustainable in your methods and approach, but still get a regenerative outcome. Do you think that's, that's possible? And, and how, how can we mitigate against that? That's a good one. I think that um, I think to answer the first question, can you be conventional and regenerative? Absolutely. So a regenerative. So often people say, well, organic and regen are the same thing. No, you can be an organic uh, regenerative farm, but just because you're organic doesn't necessarily mean you're regenerative. And I say that from a place of experience. The first thing that made us realize we needed to change something at the farm in Oxford was the soil just looked and felt dead. We were following all the rules that come with being organic certified, yeah. but we maybe didn't have the understanding as, as of, of, of the full understanding of what regeneration is all about. So I think um, when Eve Balfour set up the Soil Association, that's where she was coming from. But it's more of a not just about organic standard. It's a permaculture way of thinking. It's bringing design into farm. It's, it's teaching ourselves eco literacy again. So when I look down at the soil or when I look down at my land, can I see signs that water is running off the top or is it all percolating in for example that would be an indication it's regenerating and 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 and, and if it's not doing those things if water's sitting on top there's more to be done um that was the first question and there was another one about will we get to this point of um of getting regenerative outcomes i don't think with all things in balance, I don't think you'll get regenerative outcomes if you if you if we use Savory's EOV score, mm -hmm. that score won't it won't continue to improve or see good outcomes if other things that are happening in the system aren't aren't in balance. Okay, interesting. So so it would you do eventually you would lose the benefits of of having external inputs um, from from being able to say that you're regenerating because um, because there's a conflict there. Of like if you're bringing in feed, fertilizer, um, herbicides, and sexicides, that that eventually is going to prevent the regeneration. Is is that kind of what you mean? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're using the, all of those things on 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 your land, you won't you won't see signs of regeneration. You'll see signs of degeneration. Um, no, yeah. So it's almost like the system looks after itself in terms of. Yeah. The certification is all about the results. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the the you know obviously the EOV um, system, but there are a number of other marks which we've come across for regeneration. There's Regen Agri. There's a Greener World. There's Leaf. Um, do you know Do you know much about all these other certifications and and how, and how they operate in terms of? Because um, I, I I do think this you know I personally think Savory has a difficult time explaining what they do to the lay person. Um, I, I, I think quite often, once you start to try and get your head into holistic management, it, it's, it's like talking in Finnish riddles, you know, it, it suddenly becomes very esoteric quite quickly. Um, and, and I do think there is a need for a simplification in terms of how we message that to the public over how people are trying to explain holistic management to me. Um, and I've, I've looked briefly at, at Greener World Leaf and Regen Agri. Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how we can start to explain to the public the, the pros and cons, or if there are any cons, but just the what, what regeneration, what regenerative agriculture actually is. Um, I, I find it quite difficult. 
Yeah. Um, so the other certification schemes. Yes, I um, I haven't looked. I've been kind of keeping uh, a loose eye on all of them. So I can't speak from where I know they definitely are now. But for example, with Regen Agri, it's um, it's still coming from a place of input. You know, it's, it's a set of questions that you fill in about what you've been using. It's input based which is not necessarily, it's not a bad thing. Um, it's, 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 it's a necessary part of transition, I think. Um, it's just important that we bring in the, the, the outcomes. And that's the same across the board, not just regenerative agriculture, animal welfare, antibiotic use. It's about, you know, it's about outcomes. We've gone down this prescriptive list with lots of things we do and we're having the challenges that we're having. So we, you know, we need to change the way we do things. We can't fix we can't fix our problems with the same mindset that created them. So we need to think differently. Um, Greener World, as I understand it, is a, and it would be the way that we work with with some projects that we're doing at the moment, pilot projects. It's based on this um, a bit more of a unique plan. So your auditor mm -hmm. comes each year, you write a plan about what you're going to do and they come back next year and review how that happened, you know, how that worked and how that and then they make a judgment on whether that is, uh, you know, that is going in the right direction. And I think this this stuff isn't easy unfortunately nature is complex and we have to start to learn how to understand the complexity of nature again in order to work with it because when we take things in singularity you know again this is where we're at we've, we've wanted to work in silos because it's simple and actually nature just works its way around us so we want to just use fertilizer and just use pesticides and put them on at the certain leaf stages of a certain crop each year but now it's all not working you know so um I, I, but I do recognise, I do recognise it. And I was the same myself. You know, I, I talk all these words now. But two years ago, three years ago, I was like, uh, my answer to it all was, I'm going to bring, this is this doesn't, I, I just stop using those words. I don't understand what they mean. We need to bring different language to it. But as time's gone on, I found that actually the different language is needed because this is a different way of doing things. And if we try to use this, if we try to fit it into old language, then it, it it just it get that's where your waters get muddy. That's where potentially right. greenwashing is coming. It is about defining it as a different one, different system. Although I totally, you know, I totally get that it is a transitional thing. And what we need to do is find where everybody's, you know, where are they on the journey? What's the bit that gets them going? For some farmers, it's the water holding capacity. For some farmers, it's uh the fact they see the wildlife coming back. You know, there's different angles into it for ev for everybody. Um so there is no kind of like one hook and therefore the, the, the explanation kind of goes, yeah, goes along with that. Yeah, I, I guess I was meaning more, it's less from the farmer side and more from the angle of the public, you know, and, and if we, we, you know, we, we had a product recently, which um, was a co-branded product. We supplied regeneratively certified through Gen Agri, regeneratively certified beef to a company making ready meal lasagnas and it went into a cardo. And I, I believe this is the first time that certified regenerative food produce has gone into a British supermarket. It's something we're incredibly proud of. But I'm just trying to kind of get my head around how much even the sort of eco-conscious savvy shopper is, is, you know, where they're at in terms of sort of understanding the term and how long it will be before people start shopping regeneratively because um i you know I, I come from a background of being a commercial photographer i was working for advertising and magazines for 20 years and so i'm a great believer in in change coming through consumer behavior and and that you know that when when, when we say ground up i mean you and i might have different meanings to that but that i mean by ground up is consume um changing what the consumers are asking for and then seeing that trickle through and i guess i'm still trying to understand how to communicate that to you know to, to the shopper and, and and how to give them the faith in that um but yeah that, that, that that's more of a that's more more of a sort of a thought but um i think we've covered off some really interesting ideas about you know what's happening and and the scalability but you know where, where do you fia what, what what's happening what's what's the sort of next five years look like for you guys um, I'm going to answer that one in a minute and I'm just going to come back to your question about consumers. I think yeah, that part, part of it is the fact that um, we refer to them as consumers. They are people that do things, whereas actually, I don't know if you're familiar with the work that the Food Ethics Council have done on food citizenship. So there's a shift mm -hmm. in the way that it, there's a shift in the way that um, citizens, if we shift the way we think about the people that are cons ultimately consuming or eating the food at the end of 
at the end of the whole process that we've put it through as in the food industry, um, then it brings more engagement. So there's some really interesting work that shows that when people think of themselves as food citizens, they realize that they're participating in part of something. And that, that when they make a when they make a purchase, they make an action, it's that whole thing about, you know, you, you're using your purse to influence. But when we just talk about the consumer does this, the housewife buys that, the it's totally separating them. And why yeah. would they want to engage when we when we refer to them? to people like that so what i would say is i think the i think the key to unlocking that is to work on the citizen mindset um at, through the food industry and then to start to work with citizens on re-engaging with the supply, supply chain but using that citizen mindset rather than the kind of traditional method of we're british so our meat is best and now it's we're regenerative so our meat is best you know because that's so just like it's a million you know i've heard that a million times it's like the boy that cried wolf so citizen mindset i think um, and the food ethics council and their work on that oh thank you i'm going to research that. unlocking that's, that uh, and where do where do we see the next five years is um is uh that's a really good question where do we so, see so um, how you know <laughs> how far how far away do you think we're we are from um from having as much regenerative produce in supermarkets as we do currently say organic or, or can you can you see a point where there is an ocado range or a even a Tesco range of, of regenerative foods. And, uh, you know, do, do, do you think that's, that's near future or is that, is that far future? Uh, that's a good question. So I think that, um, I think we'll definitely see it in the future. I think that, um, because I, I think we really would review regen ultimately as the new conventional, you know, it's the, it will be the, it needs to be the new norm, doesn't it? If we're to yeah. see the change that we need, it needs to be the Completely new normal. Yeah. It's not a, it's not an, a, um, you know, a, 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 a added value thing i mean it will be initially because it'll have to be in order for these things to work because we don't have the scale etc so that would be where we'd see it going and i guess the pace of it will possibly be dictated to but dictated by the pace of change we're seeing in the world which is ever ever increasing so a lot of companies have made commitments around 2030 they made them a few years ago okay. 2030 seemed like it was a way away and 2030 is incredibly fast approaching breeding decisions being made now will be affecting the stuff on the shelf in 2030 you know so um it's not very long in farming terms so i think um I think that as we as we approach 2030, we'll, we'll see a lot more unless, you know, monkeypox and everything else takes over and we, we see we see bigger changes. But um, but 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 yeah, I think that will that is that is focusing everybody's mind um, at the moment. Of course, part of the problem is we don't have the volume of products. So if yeah. I wanted to be a regenerative shopper right now. I've got to work really hard to yeah. do that. And so um, there's also this piece of um, in order to fast track that there needs to be support from the from food businesses to help farmers make the transition and whatever that looks like whether it's money for capital infrastructure to change over to a regenerative grazing from set stock for example or it most importantly it's the learning so often we want there to be a piece of tech or a thing we do one thing we buy all our farmers a thing and it will solve the problem <laughs> what we need to do is everybody needs to have their own light bulb moment and yeah. there'll be different ways of creating that now tech may Tech is part of it, but it's not the first thing. We need to, all of us need to understand what our farm, how it's operating as an ecosystem and how it can produce the best food and biodiversity from that area. And then we bring in the tech to support that. Um, and so the, the, the best thing that needs to be is investment in regenerative transition at ground level, because as we know, farmers are under pressure, particularly at the moment with rising input costs, like to get, how do you make that change to get off that treadmill? And have some money and have some faith to do it differently. There needs to be support. And that needs to be through yeah, training, if nothing else, just to help people understand how to do it differently and have the coaching that they need to not only make go on a training course and go, oh, that was interesting. Yes, I'll take that home. But because this is a, a different way of, of it's a system shift, it's not just tweaking a few things. There needs to be this like ongoing support, because otherwise, when things start to not work or you're unsure of what to do when you get back home, inevitably you revert back to the old because to keep pushing in the face of difficulty when you're unsure is is hard so there needs to be a kind of remodel of the way we support farmers through it as well that's amazing that was that was absolutely incredible um to hear that described and um you, i think you mentioned a sort of a light bulb moment there that people need to have and you know me coming from a very non-agricultural background um you know sort of got 
accidentally pulled into this business just to make a film for our first crowdfunding and ended up becoming a co-founder. I, I had a bit of a light bulb moment when I visited one of the farms um, that was converting conventional arable into pasture. And I, I saw the difference in soil and biodiversity on two sides of the same eight foot track in the middle. And you know, it was, looked like completely different land. And of course it was just the use. And that to me, I, I had that, that spark, that light bulb moment of, this is reductionist, this is holist. And, and, and it was just that tiny shift in mindset of like, in one field, you're trying to reduce biodiversity because you only want, want, want one thing to grow. In this field, you're trying to increase biodiversity because it makes everything grow better. And it was such a small, tiny understanding that helped me get my head around all of this. But had I not had that, I think I'd still be struggling a lot more. So, and I think, one of the questions I got asked last night at, the, at this debate was, um, well, we both, there was myself versus, versus a, a vegan mission star chef, and we, we were debating out. Um, somebody asked the question, what, hap- what needs to happen to make people um, make changes for the better as a, as a buyer or consumer of food or a food citizen? And um, it was interesting how we both answered the question very diff- differently. The vegan chef said, get yourself on social media and get educated. And my, my reply was a bit more, get some dirt under your fingernails and see the difference. Because I think people need to experience agriculture. People need to see and feel and taste and see the difference in temperature between a wheat field ready for harvest and a, you know, and a, and a lovely lush pasture that's in, in, in the middle of the summer and, and have those light bulb moments themselves. But um, yeah, Claire, this has been fascinating. I, I, picked out loads of sound bites from uh, things you said in my mind to, to, um, to help us along with this. But uh, yeah, I, I think we've, we've got to 53 minutes. It's been, a, it's been quite an engaging talk. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about that you guys are up to or where, what, what you think people can do who are genuinely interested to find out more? Well, I think you've just summarised it there. Is that it's that dirt under your fingernails thing, but it's it's disconnection. We, we, everything we, in so many areas of life, we've become disconnected, and and it's about finding those re- reconnections, um, and and um, and and how to do that. Whether it's just reading a little bit more about the food that you're buying, or trying to seek out one special product from time to time, or just learning a bit about regenerative agriculture, listening to some podcasts, and starting to um understand it's we've all kind of say that we've learned via youtube um because there's no kind of you know definitive way of doing it but there are some some great books out there so um and of course buying you know meat from ethical butcher and others but (laughs) even if only occasionally is a a step in the right direction so we've just got to find our own each of us have got to find our own connection whether we're a farmer or a food citizen we have to kind of try and figure out how to reconnect in some way absolutely and will we see you at groundswell this year Yes, definitely a ground. Okay, we're, 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 we're there um, with, we're collaborating with Honest Burger. You mentioned yes. way back about 45 minutes ago, the, um, you know, the, the carcass balance issue. So we're, we're uh, starting up a um, collaboration with Honest Burger to balance their carcasses. So we get the primals and roastings and they're, they're starting source as a pilot scheme from regenerative. So we'll be there. Please come and say hi. We'll do, definitely. And thank you for your time. Brilliant. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you very much.